This is Aerochrome Film. It turns your standard green landscape shots into pink psychedelic dreamscapes. It's also been discontinued since 2011, making it one of the most expensive film stocks to own nowadays. In this video I'm going to try and imitate this look using a much cheaper, more available substitute. So sit back, relax, and let's roll into it. While most films are sensitive to light in its visible spectrum, infrared films like Aerochrome are sensitive to the longer wavelengths of the infrared spectrum. Aerochrome was originally developed by Kodak for aerial reconnaissance, and there are two characteristics that made it suitable for this. The first is haze reduction. On a typical hot summer day, there's a lot of chemical compounds floating on in the air, and these compounds scatter light, which creates atmospheric haze. This scattering can be wavelength dependent, so when you shoot at the longer wavelengths of the infrared spectrum, you can cut down on this scattering significantly, resulting in a crisper image. The second characteristic has to do with how plants reflect infrared light. Due to their cellular structure, plants reflect infrared light twice as intensely as regular green light. And this lends infrared images of vegetation an ethereal glow known as the wood effect. Now objects without chlorophyll don't exhibit this same effect, so it's easier to spot camouflaged objects when they are under infrared light. These two characteristics make infrared films like aerochrome ideal for spotting enemy troops and bases in thick vegetation. The images you see are from Richard Moss, a war photographer who documented the conflict in the Congo using exclusively aerochrome film and he did this to give a new perspective on the conflict but also to make it a, a statement you know alluding back to the film's original military use while aerochrome was discontinued in 2011 companies like raleigh still make black and white infrared film and if you follow the right steps you can colorize it to make it look like aerochrome you'll need a film camera Raleigh infrared film, a blue filter, an infrared filter, a tripod, and Photoshop. I first came across this technique in a video on uh, Jamie Maldonado's YouTube channel, which in turn is based on an image by Troy Walters on Flickr. I'll leave a link in the description below if you want to see the original posts. Essentially, we'll be taking three different images of the same subject, one unfiltered, one with a blue filter, and one with an infrared filter. Then we'll be stacking them together in Photoshop and colorizing them. So let's start off with some landscapes. I waited for a sunny day and went to a nearby park, busted out the tripod and got to work. The first exposure was taken with no filter. The next frame was taken with a blue filter using a slower shutter speed to make up for less light coming through the lens. The infrared filter blocks a lot more light, so the third image with the infrared filter was taken with a 3 second exposure. I used bulb mode with a handheld timer. To maximize the wood effect, I always shoot infrared photographs under direct sunlight on a sunny day. This keeps my lighting consistent so I can use the same exposure settings for all my compositions. Once you have your three images, you want to open them up in Photoshop. Load them into a single stack so that they become three different layers aligned in one file. Convert each layer into a smart object and colorize each layer. Green for the unfiltered image, blue for the blue filter, and red for the infrared image. Once that's done, change each layer to linear dodge so that they blend together. From there you can make some adjustments to the saturation and lightness until you get the image you want.
I took a couple more landscape shots using the same method. You have to be careful though to make sure you don't move the camera between shots because then your images won't line up perfectly and you'll get this weird color fringing in the area where the images don't overlap. Now the camera I'm using, the Ashika 635, shoots in a square format. Personally, I find it challenging to compose landscape shots on a square format because in a rectangular image, you know, your eyes have room to move around and rest on different parts of the image. But on a square format, it's more claustrophobic. You feel cabined, cribbed, confined, and square compositions benefit more from a central subject. However, with this trichrome method, it's difficult to have people as subjects because they have to stand still for over a minute while you're screwing on filters and fiddling with the settings and so on. Because if they move, you'll get that weird color fringing I mentioned earlier. Now, if you use a person, they have to stand very still, like a statue. So let's shoot some statues, because they don't move, or at least they're not supposed to. I scoped out some areas that have statues with leafy greens in the background to maximize the wood effect. The first was Ireland Park, which has a group of emaciated statues commemorating the Great Famine. Then I went to Don Mills Park to shoot Dwayne Linklater's sculpture series, Monsters for Beauty, Permanence, and Individuality. It was a bit overcast, but I managed to take the exposures just as there was a gap in between the clouds. The blocky sculptures fit nicely within the camera's square frame. Now keep in mind that for every scene I shoot, I'm using up three shots. On a 120 film roll, you get 12 shots per roll, so that means I can only shoot 4 scenes per roll. Seems a bit wasteful. With this in mind, somebody posed an interesting question in Jamie's video. Brian asked, If I use a camera that has a multiple exposure mode, could I just take an unfiltered picture, a blue filtered picture, and an infrared filtered picture, and then use Photoshop to get similar results? Well, with TLR cameras like the Ashika 635, it's easy to shoot multiple exposures, so I tried it out. And the answer is, it doesn't really work. This image is a triple exposure of unfiltered, blue filtered, and infrared filtered shots. The problem is you can't tease out the red, green, and blue versions of the image. So you'd be stacking the same image on itself, which ends up looking like this. So this method is a bit resource intensive, but that's analog photography in general. It's still less expensive than buying actual Aerochrome. Let me know what you think about this Aerochrome on a budget. Thanks to Jamie for making that original video. It's always fun to try out these experiments in photography. As always, let me know what you think in the comments below, and I'll see you on the next one.